Hello, Culminators. Thanks for joining us today. Ron Coleman here with you. And our guest today is Cleta Mitchell. Cleta is the Senior Legal Fellow at the Conservative Partnership Institute. She chairs CPI's Election Integrity Network. And it's really, really good that I have her on today, not only for inherently because she's going to give us a great interview and educate us, but because so many people have asked me so many times, especially since the fall of 2020, Ron, what's going to be? How do we do it? Is there any hope? Who's doing something about this? Who's going to fix it? And I have these vague answers because the answers sometimes are vague. And I've been working with the Republican National Lawyers Association. There are election integrity lawsuits underway. Mm -hmm. But then there's Cleta. And Cleta is making this her, her focus. She's going to tell you all about it. We're going to ask her questions. We're going to talk about how topical election integrity and censorship about election integrity are mm -hmm. intimately related. All right, it's, it's all you. What's going on? What are you, well, what have you been doing, Cleta? What's a nice girl like me doing in a place like this? Is that what you mean? I. Um... <laughs> well, what's the, what's the place? Where's My your headquarters? headquarters? Is uh, the Conservative Partnership is located in Washington D.C. It was founded by uh, former Senator okay. Jim Pimmitt, so... uh, who is our chairman, and I actually was the lawyer who did the legal work that uh, gave birth to uh, CPI several years ago. Uh, Mark Meadows uh, joined CPI after he left uh, the White House in January of 2021, and um, I am an election lawyer. I've been an election lawyer for decades. I've worked in the field of election law and election integrity, campaign finance, uh, all of the business and uh, regulatory uh, rules and and laws and procedures related to elections and uh, and public policy. And I was the uh, lead of the uh, volunteer attorneys uh, helping President Trump in Georgia after the election of 2020 and helped pull together. And we filed a, an election contest challenging the results of the Georgia election. 64 page complaint with detailing many thousands of illegal votes that were counted and included in the certified total. Thousand pages of uh, exhibits, uh, verified affidavits, witness affidavits, expert affidavits, and data. And guess what? We never had a judge appointed to hear the case. So ultimately, uh, we had to dismiss the case because it was moot once the Georgia presidential electors were certified. And then because of my role with the president, wow. uh, they came out, the left came after me. I, I never I, I I never heard I never heard this one. Somehow this one got covered up. I, I was ready for you to tell me that the that a judge looked at it and said, I don't see any documentation. I don't see any evidence. It sounds like a bunch of speculation. You're telling me that they didn't yeah, even want better the, than that. They didn't. They we, just under, the, under Georgia law, when you sue the secretary of state or any constitutional officer, you have to bring the case in Fulton County because that's the capital. And then the chief judge of uh, Fulton County is obligated to appoint a judge who lives in another county to actually try and become the judge that presides over the case. So we filed it in Fulton County because we had to under the law. And then the chief judge just didn't ever appoint a judge to hear the case. Well, I take that back. On January the 4th, the 4th, now the electors were gonna be certified two days later. On January 4th, we received a notice that um, a judge had been appointed uh, over the holiday weekend and was going to have a trial on Friday. <laughs> and so, I mean, but the, the truth is, I that was a new one on me. And we did have plenty of evidence. Everything that went into that case had to be substantiated. My, you know, our rule was it had to be supported by a fact witness or an expert witness who had signed a uh, verified affidavit under penalty of perjury. Um, and we just never got a judge appointed. But because of my involvement, um, I had been a partner for 20 years at a, at a major national law firm and they came after me and my law firm and uh, went after our corporate clients to, to demand that they, if they didn't fire me, the clients would fire the firm. I thought, who needs this? I left and 
and literally this week of February, well, this month, February 1st was my one year anniversary at CPI. And I've been able to work full time for a year on building uh, the Election Integrity Network. And uh, so that's what I'm here to talk about. But that's a little bit about my how, how I got to be where I am today. <laughs> Well, it is is actually fascinating to to me that um, that's how it happened because I will remember I, I will tell you just for you know as kind of a, a, an interesting um, bit of history I wouldn't be talking to you now if it hadn't happened th that way be, uh, and you might not quite realize it I'm sure that you have other things going on in your life besides wondering how Ron Coleman got to be doing so much video. But what happened was this video, this video here is the one that went viral when I was in Miami after the election, where I was raging against the threats that were being made against Trump election. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Right. It went crazy viral and it made me realize that I didn't have quite the face for radio that people had let, led me to believe and that it would be worth for me to eventually start a podcast. And so your loss was was my gain and also America's gain, because now you're doing this. I mean, and, and, and it is probably something that to a very large extent has to be done outside of traditional oh, law firms, because mm -hmm. what we learned was that they are incredibly sensitive to pressure of this type. And lawyers who are partners in these law firms have too much to lose well, to resist that pressure. Is that big, big national law firms. Um, well, we could spend a whole hour talking about big in America, but they have, they really, they compete for big corporate clients. Well, big corporate clients are uh, under, they, the left has created quite a network. Um, they've put, they've invested a lot of money into building a network for pressure campaigns so that at the drop of a hat, they can flood the general counsel and the present CEO of any corporation with thousands of emails and calls and tweets. It's interesting because the marketing departments are totally paranoid about tweets that reference their companies. Oh, yeah. And so just a few tweets um, can cause all kinds of mischief. And although in, re in reality, I can tell you based on having this had the same experience myself, and having left uh, prior to the election, a larger, not a big national law firm, notwithstanding what they would like to think, but a 120, 530 lawyer firm in New Jersey that was also incredibly paranoid about right. tweets, which and that they were going to right. lose all these clients, which doesn't happen. It, if the clients like the lawyers, they stay with the lawyers. I mean, in other words, the real clients, but but it, what you have to worry about is the woke clients, the the public, the publicly held clients right. that these firms slaver over, right. that they, they absolutely right. they right they do, and, and yeah, and then those corporate clients squeeze the firms on fees. I mean, I was under all this pressure all these years to um, keep increasing my billing rate. Well, my client, I kept saying, my clients are not Fortune five hundred companies; they're campaign committees. You know, I represent conservative candidates running for Congress in the U.S. House and Senate. I represent, you know, nonprofit organizations. You know, I represented a lot of the Tea Party groups that were targeted by Lois Lerner and Obama's IRS. I mean, I, and then what I would find when I would end up doing some work for some other partner's corporate client or for their PAC or something like that, they were the ones who had already uh, negotiated down my billing rate. And I kept saying, wait a minute, why am I having to charge these nonprofits, all you know, these rates when these big Fortune 500 companies are able to get agreements to charge even less. So, you know, look, I loved my practice. You know, had a lot of. Uh, I have nothing bad to say about my law firm, other than, you know, every big law firm, every big company, every big anything in America is being subjected to all of this woke stuff even before the term woke came about you know i would have to give a, a report every year sure. about what i'd done for diversity and i would just always report i am walking diversity i'm a conservative female from the south talks funny 
and uh, in a big uh, national law firm where that's not, I am definitely in the minority. But, and I would always complain about these, what I call the Maoist re-education camps that uh, we were required to participate in. And um, it, it, now I can, it's a relief. It's a relief. It is a relief. It's, <laughs> now I can just work on what I want to work on. I work with conservatives and grassroots activists and leaders. And, uh, and what I am intent upon doing with this election integrity network is to educate people and to say to them, if you care about the future of our election systems, you need to know two things. Number one, the left has infiltrated every election office in America. They've been doing it for over a decade. They have created all kinds of entities and almost an entire infrastructure for mail-in voting that they control. And, um, and I can talk about that at length. But the second thing that people need to understand is the election process envisions citizen engagement. And we haven't done that. And that's what I'm about, the business of trying to help people do. So you're also, by virtue of the work of, 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 the, of being in the, you know, the head of the Election Integrity Network, you're also not part no. of the GOP no. structure. That gives you a certain ability to have a certain amount of independence, because what I found as a volunteer uh, in the field was that not the people I worked with necessarily, but what they were telling me about what was going on among the leaders of the various counties and the various task forces and whatnot was that to, to a large extent, they were themselves co-opted by these election boards and relationships that they had with democratic activists and where it was a you know a, a, a good old boys network and a real reluctance because of the way party politics works especially outside of cities to um well, rock that, the boat <laughs> you know i don't know what it is about republicans but republicans have a gene somehow that is uh i don't think i should fight about that and Democrats have the gene that is, we're going to crush you. And I, I, I was a Democrat for a long time in my life. I was in my mid-30s. I was a member of the state legislature in Oklahoma as a Democrat. So I cut my political teeth as a Democrat. And it's been very interesting to me over many years. But I was president of the Republican National Lawyers Association. You mentioned the RNLA, and I was the national co-chair. Um, but there's been no... There's, there's not an understanding, there has not previously, I think 2020 changed that, but I've been fighting for years to try to get Republicans and conservatives to pay attention to what I call the process issues. The process issues are the, the political process, how people are elected, the election laws, um, campaign finance, how elections are financed, you know, all of these, you know, lobbying disclosure and re regulation and uh, campaign, uh, ethics and financial disclosure, all of these things, the left has had that market cornered forever and getting Republicans and conservatives to pay attention to that and particularly to get donors to think it's important to fund it. Um, pro, you know, fighting on these process issues has been virtually impossible. That changed in 2020. And so to that extent, I think it really did um, awaken <laughs> our side to the fact that, wait a minute, there's a lot going on here, you know, un under the surface that we've never paid attention to. I'll give you a good example. As I said, I've been doing this for many decades, and I don't care what state it is. Every state I've ever worked in, and I've worked in a lot of different states around election time, whether it was working with candidates or the parties. And what I found is this. State law in most states requires parity and the appointment of election officials and judges, workers, the people who are paid by the government to run the elections, it, those laws require parity between Republican, appointed Republicans and Democrats. And what has happened, I kept finding every state I went into, you had Democrats filling the Republican slots because the Republicans didn't go in and say, wait a minute, these are our slots. 
They just went, okay. Well, there is some of that changing now. Um, I can talk about what happened in Virginia because I spent a lot of time working in Virginia in 2021, building, helping build these election integrity networks and local citizens task forces. And those task forces went into those registrars. And because you don't register by party in Virginia, that they would just put people in and the Republicans never took lists. And now, uh, I mean, what happened in 2021 was that those, the citizens task forces, they did research. They looked to see, did this person who's a, a, an election official, did they give money to a democratic candidate? Look at their social media, look what they're saying. And they really, they went in and they, one by one, they had to say, this is not, a Republican, you don't have enough Republicans. And here are the Republicans. They recruited Republicans to spill those slots and they got to near parity in Fairfax County. Now, people may not think that matters, but I promise you it matters. It oh, matters. It matters. It matters. Of course. I, I remember when I first worked phones in Pennsylvania in 2016 and they wanted lawyers doing this. And it struck me as something of a, and I was new to it. it struck me as something of an odd choice to take people with 20, 25 years of experience to work phones. The explanation I was given, well, lawyers know how to take down, lawyers know how to fill out an affidavit. And people are going to be calling in and you're going to get their information and the name and address. And then we'll have this file of affidavits ready to go in the event that we're going to do a challenge. And we ended up not needing to do a challenge in Pennsylvania in 2016. And, but I remember saying, well, but I know this much. We've taken down so many reports of irregularities that when 2020 rolls around, oh, we'll right. be ready for them. No. And in 2020, we were absolutely right. flummoxed. It, it was as if nothing had happened. And so I mentioned this to a, another activist friend of mine who had actually been a volunteer many years earlier. And he had even more incredible horror, horror stories. He said, that's nothing. I went into, I, you know, I, I noticed that there was a, People were streaming across the street, across the, across the street from a, a, from a precinct where I was actually an election judge, I guess, or a, a poll watcher. I went into a basement across the street. There were two voting machines in the basement, and they were just feeding them with Obama ballots. And I think, that, tell me if I'm wrong, but the impression I have was that Republicans figured, look, these red precincts were always going to lose. It's not even worth the candle. Well, how can you say it's not worth the candle if you, ha if you have statewide elections being lost? And I mean, and also already this idea that there would be these car trunks, you know, boxes of ballots found in car trunks right. in the middle of the night. That used to happen. That has happened in Fairfax right, County so over the years. Yeah. Always, always. And they're always, they're always for the Democratic candidate, always and never not. And nobody finds that, you know, no one thinks that's that. All right. So here we are. Now it's 2021, 2022. We're doing things differently. Well, we're trying to. We're trying to. Just right. I mean, Virginia was a success, but just right. squeaked by. That's right? right. Just squeaked by. Do you think just squeaked by because they're it was still that close or you think just squeaked by because there's still so much more work to do on election? Well, I can tell you that the Youngkin campaign thought they were going to win by more by bigger margin than ended up happening. Uh, but I will say this, the Washington Post did articles about this, did an article about this, Time Magazine, there was a lot of media coverage of all of the poll workers and poll watchers that had been recruited and had turned out uh, to participate uh, on behalf of the Republicans. You have to be, uh, Virginia's like a lot of states, my, my, many states, maybe most states, where in order to be an, a, appointed to be a poll worker to fill those slots, um, you have to be nominated by a political party. Sometimes in some states it's a candidate. In Virginia, it's the political party. So you ask about the relationship with the Republican party, the Virginia Fair Elections Coalition um, was was a nonpartisan run by nonprofit organizations, uh, people participating with a lot of different types of organizations participating in the coalition. But um, one of the primary things the coalition did was to uh, create these local task forces and 
develop strategy among all of them, but also to engage in training people, recruiting and training people to become poll workers and, and observers. And, but then we gave them a certificate, they printed out the certificate and they had to take that to the party of their choice. It just happened most of them chose, I presume, to uh, give that to a local Republican chair, but they could have taken it to the local Democrat chair easily. But in any event, um, that relationship, it ha there has to be a relationship in this because look, Florida requires the party appointment, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, you know, all these states require that you have to have that appointment by the party. What I what we're doing, we're trying to do is build nonpartisan coalitions in the states that if the party committee wants to be a part of a coalition, great. But I think that it's better for the nonpartisan groups, the coalitions to do the training and then to feed those names and those people into um, the party for uh, deployment, scheduling and deployment. And that's what happened in Virginia. I will tell you, there were over 4,000 poll watcher and poll worker slots filled. We had, set, we co we had coverage starting on the first day of voting, which was, if you can believe this, September 17th. They had 45 days of early voting, thanks to the Democrat legislature. And, but that those slots were filled and people were watching and they were there. And I promise you, they discovered things in the, in the election offices well in advance of the time when voting started and got things fixed ahead of time. Um, I mean, there, I just think that there's no substitute. It's like being a parent. You got to be there. You can say everything you want and have all the other bells and whistles, but if you're not there, things fall through the cracks. And so that's why I'm trying to get people to understand. You can say China hacked our machines or whatever, but it doesn't matter. You got to be there. You got to be watching. You got to be in those election offices. You got to learn how it works and be there. You got to be in the nursing homes and make sure they're not stealing the votes of elderly people in nursing homes and homeless people, and most vulnerable voters. And we we published a, a citizen's guide, a citizen's guide to building an election integrity infrastructure. And that's available if you go to our website, which is www.whoscounting.us. Um, and we want to be the resource for citizens to uh, arm them, equip them to reclaim our elections. And, and we know that this is really important because the left is coming after us for doing it. They hate this. They hate this. Right, so <laughs> they sure do. So let's start. First of all, let me just show folks. Uh, here's the uh, here's the the network web page. And I suppose yeah, that would yeah, be under resources. Yeah, the yeah there you guide, go. As well. There's the citizen guide. Very yeah, good. I, I'm very impressed. Beautiful. Well, uh, you know, I you know how we <laughs> youngsters are with the internet, and he, and as you said, you made your own segue for me. You're doing my job. You're yes, scaring the hell out right. of me. <laughs> Big, they shut they you they shut you down well, well, you on know, I YouTube. I gotta tell you, so I've launched this podcast. Who's counting with Cleta Mitchell? That's my podcast. My very first guest was. Um, a former Department of Justice attorney in the voting section, Jay Christian Adams, who I've known for many years. And he, in fact, he and I founded the organization that he now, uh, he is now the president and CEO, the president and general counsel of the Public Interest Legal Foundation, which is the only public interest law firm that is solely devoted to election integrity, cleaning voter rolls, all that. So he was my first guest back in October. And what we talked about was the uh, Justice Department and how the lawyers in the Justice Department are 100% left-wing radicals, that there are no conservatives and they're the ones who are supposed to be enforcing our laws. And we talked about that for the entire episode. We didn't talk about 2020, but YouTube's reason for taking down uh, the website, I mean, the, the interview, the podcast is that, um, they don't allow any uh, discussion about irregularities, uh, fraud, or problems in the 2020 election. I thought, well, that's fine, buddy, but we didn't talk about that. 
So clearly some left-wing person complained and they just took it down. They're awful. They're awful. They're awful. YouTube, YouTube is, is probably the, the absolute worst. They're the awful. Yeah. And after it's funny because after you know that, that video that I showed you, uh, when I decided, okay, I'm I'm going to do a podcast. My first first, I crept into podcasting yeah. just doing audio. And, but actually, on a separate track, I was playing with with just doing some video social media stuff that wasn't a podcast yet. And my first inclination was, of course, to YouTube, right? And then I realized that I have to be crazy to make an, an investment. Okay in building up viewership on YouTube when for any reason or no reason or a very good reason, but just not the right reason, they could just disappear me. I'd have to be crazy to do that. So, and did you appeal like will, that, that no, YouTube decision? Right, was it not even, say, why did you take this down? That was their answer. And so their, their answer was oh, because was they the had uh -huh. misinformation about 2020. And so, you know, I said, well, we have to go fight them on this. This is crazy. They they should at least watch the video. But um, but you know what? It was the right feed. Again, things happen. We had talked about that initially, but they just the, the product the production crew and the website people just hadn't made the full move, but they moved everything to Rumble, so we don't have to deal with that again. But um, but I'll tell you what, this is very funny. I saw the glimpse, we just released uh, the latest episode. And it is an interview with uh, represent Pennsylvania State Representative Seth Grove. And if YouTube didn't like Christian Adams' interview that never talked about 2020, they're gonna love. <laughs> they're gonna love the conversation with uh, Seth Grove because he's the chairman of the state government committee in the Pennsylvania legislature, and he and his committee did an incredible. Um, long study uh, investigating everything about the 2020 election in Pennsylvania and have issued an entire report and have, I mean, it, it is, oh, gosh. it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and so, and he goes through chapter and verse about Pennsylvania. About it was Pennsylvania. horrifying. It was, I know I was in the Philadelphia um, oh, my Convention gosh. Center. <laughs> when, w w I in the hallway, when, when um, we, w the uh, order came in, walked in by um by uh who is it again uh who had oh, Corey at Lewandowski yeah uh showing that the appellate court had reversed the trial court decision and that they had to let Republicans not the poll watchers but the observers this multi-tiered and they had to let them in and they simply disregarded the order and the the council for the election board refused she we, she said you know i said we see the order but we're we're, we're going to appeal it we looked at each other there's no stay in place you have to you have to you have to comply and they knew that once it got up to the, to oh, the you, oh you mean the, the extension court, of the democratic gonna, state committee in pennsylvania that passes for a supreme court yeah, masquerade exactly as a supreme exactly court. Uh, and she, but she was, she was willing to just stand there and disregard. And we actually called, I say we, I was part of this cluster of people. Uh, we made a decision to, to call the, uh, again, I, I'm not taking any kind of credit here. It was a group discussion. I was just, I had been sent there by the, I was a, at that moment, I was a representative from the Trump campaign or maybe from the RNA. It, it, Right, lines of true. command were not very clear but in any event the idea was let's tell the judge that the order is being disregarded and have them send the sheriff and the judge said okay fine send the sheriff sheriff said um nah <laughs> and we called the judge back and said hey wait a minute we got a your sheriff won't won't enforce your order judge said well what else can i do yeah it's a, it, this is a this, this, this is a, not this is a ordered liberty <laughs> disregard of the rule of law and you know what's interesting i don't know if you've been if you followed this but in the last two weeks last week of january um the pennsylvania two pennsylvania courts issued rulings one um saying that the ballot yes. drop boxes were illegal 
because they're uh, ultra virus. There's no uh, statutory authority for the drop boxes. And that also was a ruling that um, the law passed by the legislature in 2018 allowing for absentee voting, which was something that the Democratic for mail in voting. For mail in voting. Well, no excuse absentee. They'd had excuse right. based uh, absentee voting in Pennsylvania, but they never had this no right. excuse massive mail voting. And that was. Uh, put in at the demand uh, in a negotiation uh, by, but the demand by the Democrat governor. And, but that violates the state constitution. Now, both of those obviously are gonna be appealed to the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court. But let's say this, one thing has happened. A funny thing has happened since 2020. They had elections in 2021 and elected uh, either one or two Republicans to the state Supreme Court. The Democrats still have a majority, but one of their justices is up for re-election this year. And um, let's see if they continue to be act in such a partisan, blatant, fra flagrantly partisan manner. We'll see. Uh, but and in Wisconsin, within the same week, the Wisconsin uh, court found that the drop boxes in Wisconsin were um, unlawful under Wisconsin law. And then the darn Supreme Court of Wisconsin with the quote unquote conservative being the swing vote, uh, allowed, voted to allow the uh, drop boxes to be used in the April primary while they're deciding the case on a permanent basis. So, you know, look, I mean, one of the things that I think a big failure in 2020 and, and since has been the failure of, of the judiciary, starting with the judge who didn't appoint a judge eligible to hear our lawsuit. Ab absolutely. It, it, I actually uh, did a little, a little poll and I asked people, what do you think is the branch of government that failed most profoundly uh, in 2020? And Judiciary was not even one of the, it was the, it came in third. I said, you're all wrong. It is the judiciary because the other two branches are frankly political and we expect, right. And they shouldn't be unethical. They shouldn't, they shouldn't the be law. crooked, but we, but right. But we expect them to be political. The judiciary has been execrable. It failed. And this includes, as you said, Republican appointees. And this is, you know, um, a, the federal society has not covered itself in glory with the way uh, mm -hmm. conservative judges. And, you know, I'll tell you something. You know, I'm, sure, I guess, I'm sure you're going to agree with me, but look, it's, this is how I want you to, this is how I'm going to raise this proposition and, and hopefully hear what you have to say about it, which is that a lot of people, including a lot of lawyers, don't appreciate that, that the judiciary is a mm -hmm. culture unto itself. And I think especially now with the internet where everything is national and everything is instantaneous, judges look over their shoulders of what other judges are doing, regardless of party. And if they see that all the judges are throwing out Trump election cha um, They're um, challenges, They're afraid. they don't want, they they don't don't want, want to be, be yeah. that guy. They don't want to touch it. They don't it. want to be that guy. They don't want to touch it. And, and it, is, it is shameful. And the whole reason we give lifetime tenure to federal judges is precisely so they shouldn't be they, they shouldn't be subject to that influence. Well, you know then, the, the thing that is uh, again it's it's genetic in the Republicans or whatever, but you know I, I practiced before the Federal Election Commission for many many years, and there's three Democrats, three Republicans, and for the first I would say uh, 20 years of uh, its existence, the FEC Democrats they always knew what their job was, and they always had, there was always one Republican who would join the Democrats and they just ran roughshod, ran the place. And in 19, oh, well, 2000, uh, 2000, about 1999, 2000, uh, Mitch McConnell, I think, uh, Mitch McConnell nominated Bradley Smith, who's a conservative law professor who is has a spine of steel. And he basically turned the tables on them and and the FEC has deadlocked. I mean, ever since then, the Republicans have known if you go on the commission, you're supposed to stand up for the First Amendment. You're not supposed to roll over and play nice with the Democrats. And it's become a very polarized uh, commission. And now, of course, the, the left wants to scrap the format so that it, they appointed a speech czar. Uh, but 
I found that with with concern, uh, many of these conser- so-called conservative judicial appointees that we've spent all these years a movement to get conservatives in the judiciary rule of law conservatives and once they get there it's like they're afraid to upset the apple cart with their colleagues who have been disregarding the constitution for all these years um i mean it is shocking to me i don't understand it i I don't understand but i will tell you this i used to tell my daughter when uh, her whole life, it is better to be respected than liked. It is better to, you know, act on your beliefs. It's better to be respected than liked. And when she was about a junior in high school, there was some little tussle going on among the girls in her class. And I said, oh, but so-and-so and so-and-so, well, they're, they're, I thought they were really nice. And my daughter looks at me, she says, mom, nice is overrated. And I thought, yes, I have been a good mother. It's a good daughter. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I, 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 I kind of as a little bit tongue in cheek, I put in my in my Twitter um, bio, nice guy. <laughs> uh, but but be, because when, whenever somebody says what a nice guy I am on Twitter, I told them to retract it. because It's, it's bad for business. And I, I can't have people saying that about me. You know, Cleta, we could do this I think for a very long time, yes. and we need to spend more time together offline because I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, that we have a lot that we could talk about. Um, I always ask at the end of each interview. Well, you, you know, I am, I am hopeful are because hopeful? I do believe uh, that, you know, the left has so much money. There's so much money and they poured in hundreds of millions of dollars into trying to take over our election process. And, I'm getting ready to, and maybe I'll come back and talk about this. Um, there now, there now is a, <laughs> literally a secret plan, and I say secret because um, all of these plans that the White House has organized, ordered federal agencies to submit their voter registration and voter mobilization plans back in September, they, using our tax dollars to basically do what they did with Zuckerberg's money in 2020. Um, but we will never have the money that the left has. But if Americans will get engaged and will, and, I, and I'm a big believer in giving people things to do that are real, not just, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm happy to go to a rally and I watch the Trump rallies, all of them, you know, I still watch them on, you know, my iPhone and all, but I want people to do real meaningful things. And if we, honestly, groups of 10 and 20 people who get educated, and mobilized in the election offices, watching what's going on, and that's getting my citizen's guide, listening to my podcast, uh, Who's Counting, and being engaged. I think people, we can make the difference. People can make the difference. And this is a fight. This is a fight to reclaim our elections. So I'm hoping that people, and I am hopeful, and hoping that people will rise to the challenge and uh, save our elections. Well, you know, I just you you said something there that I think just has to be mentioned again before we get off. It's still, you know, for for people such as you and I who are over thirty, um, it still sounds funny to say, doesn't it, or to hear someone say, "The left has all the money," because I think that there's this instinctive feeling that people have that, well, of course we know, Republicans. That's the party. Not of anymore. Business, that's the party of Wall Street. Not anymore. Not anymore. And and I mean, it's. I don't think anyone who's listening to Coleman Nation is under any illusions about that. But we have to remember just how much grassroots has to make up for the complete co-option yeah. of the business sector. Uh, and be, you know, going back to the beginning of the interview where we talked about how you you were essentially pushed out of mm-hmm. corporate law. And I was also essentially pushed out of corporate law. I know, and and that's couldn't be happier working for, uh, with with with, with Harmy Dillon. It's it's a, such a breath of fresh air. But it's a different it's a different environment. It's a different you know range of opportunities, and we have to some extent. When I say we, I mean we as a movement and uh, we Republicans. We have ourselves to blame yeah. for letting it get to this point. Uh, but we, I think you're right. I think that a little bit, I mean, look, I will tell you, you know, Harmeet said to me, Ron, you, you know, 
Harmeet's a big muckety muck in the GOP. She is very active in California. I can't get anyone in the New Jersey Republican Party to even pick up the phone. I want to, I'm, I'm here to volunteer and to help, you know, integrate myself into, you know, into the organizations uh, so that I can, I'm not asking to be made chairman of anything. I just, I, I'm just willing to be there uh, as a guy with, you know, connections into the RNC through Harmeet and someone with some experience in election law. No one responds to my emails. No one responds to my social media inquiries. If we're not going to try, nothing's going to Well, I just, I think that um, we just have to do it ourselves. And, and, you know, I'm a very also big believer in if we build it, they will come. And that's what happened in Virginia. Um, People, and I've told the guys at the RNC this, I said, you know, I have to spend the first 20 minutes of any conversation with somebody I'm trying to get involved, listening to a litany of grievances against the uh, Republican Party, local, state, and national. And I said, I just listen to that and say, fine, that's fine. Okay, that's then, this is now, let's organize our own coalition, let's organize our local task forces. Uh, our My uh, election integrity network is gonna be sponsoring um, nine statewide summits in uh, nine states, uh, cool. election integrity summits, where we're gonna be doing training. Uh, our first one is in Atlanta, February 18th and 19th. And uh, I can send you the flyer, uh, but we, the point is uh, we're gonna be doing our best to recruit people, train people, to take over their local election offices and be there watching what's happening and making sure that they follow the law. Look, I'm a big rule of law person. I'm not talking about bullying anybody, threatening, intimidating. That's what the left is accusing us of. That's not what we're doing. It is, we want them to follow the law. So join us. Come on in. This is the only way we're going to win. The water's fine. Come on in. (laughs) Cleta, it really is. Thank you. Cleta, thank Thank you so much. Really great talking to you.